Good evening. I'm Stephen Fagan, curator of the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, and welcome to Trauma, Tragedy, and the Healing Power of Music, a program that supports our special exhibition, Art Reframes History. And we are connecting with a, a most prestigious panel tonight. We have musicians, composers, and scholars, including four individuals whose works are featured in Art Reframes History. Now I'd like to introduce the panel. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to get to talk to all of you. Uh, rather than do formal introductions for each of you, I thought we might just kind of go down the line and let each of you introduce yourselves and talk maybe a little bit about the work that's featured in Art Reframes History. And uh, Steve Mackey, we'll start with you. Steve Mackey, a musician, a Grammy award-winning composer, and a professor of music at Princeton. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, yeah, well, it's my pleasure to be here. And uh, I wrote a piece uh, called One Red Rose, and it, it takes its title uh, from the fact that uh, that iconic photo of uh, Jackie and JFK uh, landing in the Dallas airport. Uh, of course, they only flew from Fort Worth, but uh, and uh, Jackie was presented with a with a bouquet of roses with her that uh, you know pink pillbox hat. And at the end of the ordeal of the day, uh, when the, the Secret Service combed the, um, the limousine for clues about this um, uh, 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 assassination, um, all they found in the, in the back seat was one uh, blood-soaked blood uh, red rose. And that just seemed, just thinking about that and reading about that um, just hit me deeply that, uh, and that and it transformed my thinking of the event instead of trying to you know capture the 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 sort of the the, the realism of and narrative of the thing um i my thinking was transformed to just really trying to capture um what all of this must have been like for for jackie so it's really from jackie's point of view and that and that rose is sort of a kind of one lonely uh, rose left over is kind of a, a symbol of that. Excellent. And then I'm going to introduce our next two panelists together because they are frequent collaborators, but we have David T. Little and Royce Vavrick, the composer and librettist of the opera JFK that premiered at the Fort Worth Opera in 2016. Gentlemen, it's great to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Great to see you, Stephen. Yeah, um, so excited. So yeah, we wrote the opera JFK. It was um, commissioned by Fort Worth Opera. And, you know, we were specifically asked to explore the time before the assassination, leading up to the assassination. So the time spent in Fort Worth. Um, and of course, with any piece about, you know, that period, you can't ignore the assassination. It's such a, it's such a heavy part of of the story, it kind of inserts itself no matter what you do. And so part of our challenge was to tell a story that um, could use that, uh, that fact to explore something bigger, I think. And so we wrote a piece that really focuses on questions of fate and mortality, uh, and also focused very much on Jackie um, as, a, as a kind of the person who carries our national grief after that day. Um, and Royce found a lot of really brilliant ways uh, through paintings and using portals and dreamscapes. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about the sort of structure of the, the piece and how we approached it. Yeah, well, it's really interesting to see where we started and where that piece ended up because initially it, the treatment looked like a pretty straight ahead bio opera, um, exploring that like 12 hour period. Uh, when he was in Fort Worth. And, um, and so it, it began that way, but then we decided that, that we had to find our own personal in. And so it became a far more surrealist uh, landscape. Uh, and so, it, it, so we sort of exploded the story while retaining the truth. Uh, and so I think that uh, it, it was a really fascinating piece that, that we really stumbled into in, in many ways. Uh, it, it, it has taken on a, a life of its own in, in, yeah, in many ways. And it sort of so, taught us a lot about ourselves creatively, I think, as we were writing it. We learned a lot about what we believed about art in a oh way. Oh my God, absolutely. Discovering this piece together, which was really beautiful. And 
Yeah, and it was our first grand opera as well. So it was just a whole bunch of firsts and we were really breaking ground as a collaborative team. And um, it, it felt like a major, major statement from us um, four years ago now. Okay, excellent. And now we have Jesus Martinez, a local composer here in the Dallas area and a band director at Sam Houston High School in Arlington. Jesus, it's great to see you tonight. Hi, Steven. It's good to see you. Yeah, we, um, the, my commission started with the, uh, the Sixth Floor Museum with you and uh, with Nicola Longford. Um, we wanted to do something for the 55th anniversary and the 30th anniversary of the, the opening of the museum. So we, uh, we did the first piece with um, the Julius Quartet that was the award-winning uh, quartet over at SMU. And uh, we, we followed, well, basically the, the idea of the quartet was um, based on his legacy. So we started off with um, the first movement, Sniper's Perch. And then we had a moment of mourning, a period of mourning through the nation in crisis. And then lastly, the, le the legacy. And um, you follow the quartet, uh, you also follow, you can follow through the exhibit of the museum because those were the three, one of the three um, most uh, important spots that I felt were, were just uh, breathtaking to me when I, when I went to go and visit the museum. And the, the second commission, I was very fortunate to bring my students along, my high school students, and um, do a, a click track to a 16 minute film that Mr. Fagan, you and um, and the videographer over the, at the museum had created together. Uh, we spent um, maybe three weeks in the summer trying to find footage from uh, the motorcade from when the Kennedys landed at Love Field and where they were supposed to go and where they ended up in Parkland and then finally going back. And, you know, in many ways it was, it is a lot about Jackie now that I, I saw the film, uh, um, last night just getting to see Jackie's reaction at the beginning and then we put Jackie's reaction you know hand in hand from when she landed to from when she left and um, getting to to write music right underneath this Pruder film was very haunting and and uh, special at the same time and it, it was just a wonderful experience for my students to to be able to be in this immersive landscape uh, where music was able to to tell the story more than anything else. And saving the best for last, we have Ginny Olivia Johnson, Associate Professor of Music at Wellesley College and an expert on music, memory, and trauma. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me and for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, unlike our esteemed composers, I, I'm also a composer, but I've never written music about JFK. However, um, I have written music about trauma and I've studied trauma and its relationship to music for many years. I'm, I'm very interested in how music and trauma interrelate um, at the fulcrum of memory. I'm very interested in how we remember trauma, how we negotiate trauma, the uh, ways in which trauma can defy straightforward narrative, can sort of fragment our experiences into tiny shards that maybe we carry with us for many years and how our relationship to traumatic experiences can change over time. The multivalent aspects of trauma are very interested, interesting to me. Um, and I'm very interested in these projects because I think a lot of us experienced the trauma of JFK kind of through the temporality of television and media. And that's another very big interest of mine is how media and television intersect with the way that we remember collectively and personally, and also how collective memories that we share get grafted onto or interact with our more personal traumas. And I'm, I'm very curious to hear more in this discussion from our composers about how their personal memories of the event, whether they live through it or not, intersect with other more personal traumas or personal intense experiences and, and what the relationship is there. So very excited for this discussion. Excellent. Well, let's just jump right in with that idea of memory versus uh, learning about an event uh, through television, through books, through media later on. Uh, Steve, you are the oldest on our panel and the only one who has childhood memories of 1963. Maybe you could take us back for a moment and tell us what you remember from that day. As has been talked about a lot, you know, this uh, the Kennedy assassination was a was a, a touchstone for, you know, many, many people. Um, where were you when JFK was shot? Is a is a is a you know common uh, phrase when you when you're getting to know somebody. Somebody. I was uh, seven years old and I happened to be home sick with a cold, home from uh, school, uh, and um, and I had a little TV with you know rabbit ears, just a little black and white TV with rabbit ears, and just as the uh, whatever you know cartoons I was watching were interrupted 
with this news flash, I heard um, our the neighbor, and we were in an apartment building, and I heard the neighbor, um, Mrs. Tui, uh, run in to our our apartment, no knocking, just ran in and screaming that uh, uh, JFK had been shot. And I went downstairs and saw both um, Mrs. Tui and my mother sobbing. And it's uh, one you know really striking thing for me about this memory is the first time I ever saw my mother cry. Um, I'm sure she, you know, pulled her hair out and cried about many things that I did up until that point. But that's the first time I really saw her cry and really saw her as as a you know a passionate human as a um, you know, it's the first glimpse that she was the star of her own movie with her own inner life, as opposed to being a supporting character in my movie. Um, and then flash forward to getting this commission. Um, I researched the event. I had that memory, but I then researched the event. It was only, you know, later, you know, in 2012, leading up to this commission, which was to commemorate the 50th anniversary, uh, that I saw the Subruder film and that I read about, you know, things. And, um, and that put a whole different spin on it. You know, at first it was really about my, you know, my mother, my relationship to my, to my mother, my mother's relationship to the outside world. And then, uh, and, I, and, and that's what made me really excited to accept the commission. I said, yeah, I have personal feelings about this. When I saw the Zabruder film, I was so horrified. I thought, I, I can't write music about this. You know, I, the, this is too big for music. Um, uh, and I came around uh, ultimately um, with, a, with a couple of things. One, this idea that, you know, this one red rose is a like simple symbol. Um, and another thing was just the idea of, um, that I wasn't going to try to tell the story, um, but I was gonna use the, the emotional forces that I had, including, you know, the memory from, you know, from being seven years old, including my reaction to the Zabruder film, uh, including the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the chaos that ensued, the manhunt, the, you know, into the theater, all that stuff that happened that I read about. And instead of trying to tell that story, I just, I picked, you know, uh, several of those energies, those forces, those elements, and I tried to musicalize them, including what it was like, you know, to be, um, in Fort Worth, you know, connecting to, to David and Royce's piece uh, in, in Fort Worth, um, it was drizzling that morning and they really wanted to have, and, and, but it cleared up, which enabled them to, to be in an open convertible. Um, and so just capturing one of my energies that I wanted to capture was just, you know, the raindrops falling and how, how significant that was when, it, when the sun came out. And so capturing the sun coming out. So I have all these little miniature ideas and then I put these ideas together the way music goes. Once they became music, they were no longer, you know, uh, prose. And I no longer felt obliged to, to order them as a story was ordered. And in some ways, I'm exploding the story in a, in a similar surreal way to the way David and, and Royce did. Right? Rather than if you made a movie of my piece, it would have been very nonlinear, reaching back to the seven-year-old me, you know, and all these different scenes become musical motives that go together the way music goes together, uh, not the way stories go together. Uh, Jesus, you're the farthest removed from 1963, born decades after the assassination. I'm just curious, in contrast to, to Steve's firsthand perspective, what did you do? What kind of research did you go through in order to try and uh, put yourself in the position of someone from 1963 to explore this subject. I uh, listened to One Red Rose and followed JFK Opera. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it, there was a lot more research to that, obviously. But, uh, you know, I had been studying uh, Steve's piece for years. Um, I was able to see the recording from Brentano Quartet and uh, when we pieced, uh, the, when we asked Julius to perform it, Julius also has a connection with Brentano, and they were mentored by them as well. So, um, I don't know. There was a lot of a lot of research that went into place. There's also a lot of uh, family memories and family stories um, in South Texas, where I'm from. We're about ten miles from the border to Mexico, and JFK is still beloved uh, down there. They love him and they um, they adore and they appreciate him and Jackie is especially. So I grew up hearing stories from my mother and my grandparents about um, 
this president that was very ambitious and, you know, you know, that they, they just kind of saw as like this knight in shining armor in some ways. Right. So um, I grew up with that, with that feeling. And uh, when I moved up here to Dallas and I, you know, I was able to receive this commission um, this, I, you know, I've, I've read through the diaries of, of Jay, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jackie. And I read through uh, the, the letters from Jackie to Bernstein to Lenny and how special those were as well while Lenny was writing mass. And, um, it, you know, it, it all just came full circle. And I, I think the biggest thing was when I uh, toured the Sixth Floor Museum, I think it was 9 a.m. right before it opened with Nicola, that I started getting the idea of, oh, I need to incorporate a sniper, a, a sniper perch here, a sniper's perch, a, a thematic material for, uh, for Oswald and what he was thinking and how everything was going. And then afterwards, um, the, the two days before the concert, Mr. Fagan, if you remember, you told us about Oswald's ring, and that was especially um, powerful for us and the quartet. So I think the amount of, of research, it didn't stop, it didn't stop even when I had finished the piece because the quartet and I were still researching and trying to figure out ways to, to, um, to make the piece better. And uh, really, uh, Steve, uh, your, your piece, the ricochets that you had on the, the fourth, 16th note. I mean, I, that was something that I incorporated on my, on my legacy piece. And I, I added glissandos there to just kind of an homage to you and, and David, I used some of the, the, I used some subharmonics on a violin, on the first violin to kind of incorporate the opening of your opera with some of the, the aleatoric stuff at the top. So, I mean, it, it's kind of nice talking to two musicians that I looked up to and studied during this piece. And then I was able to just kind of spin it and make it my own in some ways with some help, obviously, so. Interesting, you mentioned those ricochets because uh, th those were inspired uh, by the footage of the 21 gun salute at the at the funeral and just the you know the it, it, the you know in, you know of the shells falling on the ground you know that's very yeah. interesting um just, but just thinking about the different balances of these gunshots and these different works Stephen it's, yeah. it's good to know that you were thinking about the the funeral, I assume, or the like a celebration yeah. where these gunshots were going off. And it makes me think of um, J. Martin Daughtry's work on, on the experiences of soldiers in Iraq and the hearing of gunshots. And oftentimes acoustics in, in traumatic memory take a kind of front stage. Like for instance, when Jackie was in the motorcade, she doesn't remember what happened, her, her climbing on the roof of the car, and, but she does remember acoustic memories. She does like reveal that she does remember gunshots and screaming, but like nothing else retained. And, and Martin Daughtry's work talks about how soldiers remember gunshots more than anything else. And that tells them whether they're in a tactical zone, a trauma zone, or a safe zone. And so gunshots take on all these different meanings that are almost unconscious. So it's, it's interesting for me to hear that like you both dealt with gunshots, but in very different ways. And I'm curious to hear more if you want to speak to it. Yeah, there, there is, um, I, I think with, with my, with the piece, the first, the, the first movement of the piece, um, uh, what I did is uh, well, I created just two big open chords with a string, with a string quartet. But, um, you know, just kind of talking about David's a little bit with his aleatoric thoughts towards that. Um, I used some, some techniques that were very extended to kind of create this, you, you know, it, you see this in movies all the time, you hear a gunshot and all of a sudden everything slows down or the director goes back just a minute, you know, and everything just kind of, so that was the idea to, to find these extended techniques with a quartet and, and create that and also have kind of like this really weird sub melody underneath, which created a, that we created with the sub harmonics on, on the first violin where you can't really tell it's a melody, but it's, it's right underneath and it's building this immense amount of tension. Um, so I use that. And then uh, uh, Mr. Fagan, if you remember, we, we talk about John Williams a lot with the film uh, in the legacy, you know, it's the first thing I added. I forgot to tell you this months ago, but we do da 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 So I'm adding that through the through the violin. I'm mean, I'm sorry, the viola and the and the cello right underneath to kind of have that march like feel. So I think it's it's interesting that we had that uh, that funeral thought in our head, right? I mean, e even with the quartet and, and us doing some collaborative work, they're talking about doing Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings, which was performed at the funeral as well. So being able to link all these pieces together, I think is, is just really, I don't know, it's, it's very interesting, it's special. Well, the, the question of the, the gunshot 
if I can jump in and just talk about in the opera, how we sort of dealt with that. I mean, even though we didn't go to Dallas and we don't see the assassination, you could make an argument that the, that we passed the time when the assassination happened. And there's a moment right at the very end of the work where there's a sort of crescendo in the brass and it sort of cuts off suddenly. And then there are three sort of final timpani notes and that's the end of the piece. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting to see in the various productions how directors have interpreted that. Um, I don't know, it wasn't explicitly trying to say, oh, well, this is the gunshot moment or that this is the gunshot, but it certainly has been interpreted that way in stagings, um, which I think is very interesting. And, but it, I think it also plays along with this idea of absence, right. that even in the absence of um, a sound that is a gunshot-like sound, right. the gunshot, the energy of the gunshot is somehow still present. Yeah, and that it kind of sucks the air out of the room in a way. Yeah, sometimes aftermath is the more traumatic thing than the event itself. And so that's very interesting. Did you find, David that, and Royce, that you had a preference hearing different production and um, conductor decisions about how to deal with that musical event that could index the gunshots? I'm always, I don't know if you, how you feel, Royce, I'm always very open to see what a director will do. It's part of what I really love about working in opera, mm -hmm. the discovery. Yeah, that point about absence is really important, I think, and that reverberation and ricochet in Steve's piece. And, uh, and Jenny, then, you mentioned several times the, the, the word multivalent and, and I think the gunshot idea in particular uh, took on a very multivalent sense for me. For one thing, I was afraid of the gunshot. I mean, and, and, you know, the, you know the, the Zabruder film, the, the, the visual, but um, so the gunshot for me um, becomes, uh, or, or gunshots become very multivalent. They become this ritualized uh, part of the 21 gun salute at a funeral, which uh, accompanies, uh, you know, that beautiful uh, uh, um, a bugle performance of taps, which with a, with a cracked note, you know, um, right. so it becomes connected to that cracked note. It also right. it is related to the, the, the falling rain that, you know, could have prevented the, um, the open convertible, right? You know, so, so the rickish the, the, of the falling rain you know, becomes these shell casings of the funeral, um, and and then the gunshot becomes broader. I don't, I don't have a gunshot moment. Rather, I have uh, chaos, and um, uh, including, you know, what what by then we know is my rendition, you know, of of gunshot. But it's um, it's included in just ongoing chaos. So there's no, you know, one moment, but. But, um, but, and I think that's very important you know, to the approach I was talking about before of like musicalizing the energies and then letting them be music. And as a result, they n naturally, the way music does become very multivalent, you know, and, and reach out to touch different things. And have multiple meanings simultaneously that you're kind of collapsing all these different acoustic images on top of each other and inviting yeah. a very complex response, which is yeah. something that music does so well. Yeah. Yeah, That's really and, it, great. and it doesn't tell a straight narrative that well. So. Exactly. Yeah, I, I love that point too, because I think music does operate a lot like trauma in, in terms of its repetition, mm -hmm. its spiral nature, its, its ability to bring us back around. And that's often how traumatic memories function rather than a straightforward you know, beginning and end stories. I'm curious what uh, inspiration, uh, particularly Royce, you and David, you visited Dealey Plaza very soon after getting the commission from the Fort Worth Opera, as I yeah. understand. I'm curious what inspiration you drew maybe from the site, the soundscape of the plaza, being there and listening to the reverberations of uh, the buildings around you. Uh, what, what was it like, that, that power of place? Yeah, well, um, so I, I was born in 83. Um, so I missed um, the assassination by a long shot. Um, so, and because I'm Canadian as well, it wasn't taught to us in, in high school or, or grade school. Uh, and so it, all, everything from the ground up for me was, uh, was learning, was taking in this unbelievable story and trying to read as much as possible and to take in as many of the ghosts as humanly possible. And so um, we getting to spend as much time as we did in Texas was so important. Um, and the museum was just one of those moments that just, it, it made me, it, it, it ignited my imagination in a way that I had no idea uh, was possible. 
Um, and just getting to go, it, it really feels like you're going on a journey visiting the museum and, and you get this comprehensive look um, and getting to go through those emotions and, and to sort of process them uh, as uh, in, in one's own way was just so magnificent. And standing on that X in the street is just one of the most, um, yeah, I, I don't even know how to describe it, but it, it was just this, the sensation of, of being in this place where this event that we were trying to internalize and then um, ex abstract and extrapolate on through these surrealistic uh, dreams and, and uh, episodes in our, or I think it's in parts, right, David? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These, well, these 31 moments. 31, 31 moments. moments. Moments, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, but it really, I, I will for, I will hold in my heart that moment of standing on the X. Thank goodness uh, it was a, it must have been a slow traffic day. Um, but, um, but it, yeah, it was just a, a really, really magnificent thing to be there and to, to breathe that air and to hear those sounds, as you said, and to hear the reverberations and just be part of that, to be, to be part of this system that was, that is in place. When we talk a lot about ghosts in our work that are, you know, we're really communing with, with ghosts and communing with spirits in a lot of the work that we do. And those are maybe one way that we talk about emotions or emotional resonance of, of a place. So I think, you know, spending the time in Dallas standing by that X for me is also one of the most chilling, just that there is this X that is right there that you just can't miss. Um, I find still just, harrowing you know and being able to look down from the window and that whole experience and also the time we spent in fort worth and standing on the spot where kennedy gave his impromptu speech in the parking lot right and um, being in the hotel which has now been you know remodeled but being in the ballroom and and just experiencing the resonance of place you know and and i think for for us that informed the work a lot and i think also informed about you know how the work evolved from this sort of more traditional narrative to one that was more circular, more abstract, more fantastical, more rooted in dreams uh, or hallucinations. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it was, and also I think, you know, for us, this question of conspiracy factored in as well. You know, we didn't want to get into, we didn't want to make a conspiracy theory piece but the, the work does explore a kind of cosmic conspiracy, if you will, right? And I remember standing outside the Sixth Floor Museum, there's a plaque and it says, you know, from this window, Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, and someone has written in allegedly, you know, <laughs> above the, like in graffiti on this plaque, uh, allegedly shot. Um, and so I love the, that there are still, despite the amount of research and interest, there are still so many questions and I think asking questions is a big thing that we're interested in as well. I, I speaking to that, um, I did a, an interview around the time of my piece with a, a, an NPR show, The Takeaway, which is still still going. And uh, after the show, I got all these emails and messages saying, you know, you you missed the opportunity to um, you know to debunk this Oswald myth and. And uh, and talk about the conspiracy, the true conspiracy that went on, and and you know everybody had a different story, and I think that was one of the other reasons why um, focusing on on Jackie enabled me to to move forward because it, it doesn't matter, you know, in in one red rose it doesn't it doesn't matter, uh, but right. yeah, um, but also speaking about that place, um, yeah, you know, it, it's weird when you. You, you see a place, uh, uh, you know, on, on TV and news coverage and you think about it and it's, uh, you know, it's a very different situation. But as a, as a fan of Chicago blues, I remember the first time as, a, as an adult going to some of these clubs in, in Chicago that, you know, were that Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters had played. And, you know, in my mind, they were, uh, you know, shrines. And you go there and they're just, you know, dingy bars, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so going to Dealey Plaza and, and uh, going to the sixth floor museum and to the Sniper's Perch, um, I, I just, there was this, it was just bigger in my, in my mind than when I got there. And it was like, oh, it's right there. You know, and I could see that, you know, I'm just, it's right there. And it was all so, um, you know, uh, so not, grand um that it i don't know it just it 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 uh it struck me it chilled me 
A lot of those uh, conspiracy theories that exist do so because of the Zapruder film, which in many ways allows us all to be eyewitnesses to the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, the Zapruder film turns up in one of Jesus's works, and of course it's uh, used to great effect in the closing moments of the JFK opera. Um, Jenny, you've written on the Zapruder film. Maybe you can talk a little bit about why uh, that is such a crucial window to understanding the moment and the memory of the assassination. Sure. Um, I, I came to the Zapruder film through a totally circuitous route. I was writing about how people that grew up in the 1980s and were inundated with PSAs, public service announcements about uh, child abuse and molestation and satanic panic rituals, um, found themselves wondering and questioning whether they had had those experiences themselves. And so I started working backwards into television's history and its relationship to trauma. And um, I, I myself did witness the Challenger explosion on TV in school. That's another kind of thing we were gonna maybe talk about today was this, the similarities in some ways between the kind of globalness of these two traumas. And so um, I, I looked at that and I actually wrote a piece about it. And then I, and then I came the, across the Zapruder film and I, I, the first thing that struck me about it was that it was silent, you know, it's super eight film, it's analog, it's very, in, a, in some ways grainy, but also very luminous and clear and the colors are very saturated. And even though, I, I mean, I saw it many times as a kid, you see it in film, uh, I, somehow without realizing the index, I knew, I knew this thing. I had somehow been ex exposed to it quite a bit as a child without even really realizing it or absorbing it. And of course I knew about the assassination, but it was much more of an abstraction for me when I was younger. And then coming back to it, realizing, wow, I think there's something here too, in terms of how we all collectively remember this trauma through this mediation. And, and I was especially interested in the fact that so many people have seen it so many times. I was interested in the fact that it's been edited. In some edits, you actually see the impact, you see the trauma of, of the bullet. Um, in, some, in some edits, you don't see that. It's cut out and you just have this sense of Dealey Plaza and it's, it's all of its glory before the assassination and the beauty of everybody waving. Um, and so all of that kind of bolstered some of my thinking just about the temporalities of the television and how the temporalities of media in general can inform people's memories to, to different extents, sometimes to the extent that you feel like it, it, it personally happened to you, even though you weren't there and don't have any actual relationship. I mean, I, that's arguable, of course, because everybody felt, I think, a relationship to the president and to the presidency and all of this, I think, felt very personal, but it was also collective. Um, but then also, you know, people could feel in some, in some cases like, um, you know, this had gotten entangled with their own personal traumas and, it, and, and the film itself becomes some kind of reliquary for those memories. And so that, those were my interests and that's the way I, I kind of wrote about it. But I, I was also referencing an article talking about how television came about during World War II and it became kind of this medium that was indelibly intertwined with the trauma of the war and, and something that would reroute our experiences and edit them for us and kind of teach us how to remember things. And I think there are ways in which that's a comfort and also, um, a distraction from what really happened. And, and so I think it's interesting to think about the, all of these things in tandem with music, because music does this really interesting work of, of re-encapsulating and rerouting and, and repeating um, memories that kind of don't have a place to be otherwise. I think television can kind of encapsulate and crumble these memories into this, this place that becomes a little bit more um, easy to digest, if you will. Um, so these these are all the things I talked about in that article. So sorry to go on, but um, I'm very interested just in the, that film's place in in this tragedy and in this collective memory. Jenny, I love what you said about the colors in that film, and I think you know the way it was used in the opera. And we have to give credit to Thaddeus Strasberger, who's the director of the premiere production. That was part of his his uh, design. Um, it, the film itself, as used in the opera, is edited it in such a way that we don't actually see anything happen. We just kind of see the colors and the co how the colors are moving right. through space. And that I think is plenty, right? For, it to, for us to react to it in the way that I think he intended for the audience to react to it. And certainly for me watching it, it was you know just seeing the particular hue of pink and the particular hue of green is just, you know. Right. And, and I think it plays again that what you said about absence earlier, the absence that's sort of also very much a presence for most of us. We can just see a snippet of that film. We know exactly what it is. We don't need to see anything further. But I think that's, that's an interesting thing that you're playing with, too, is that you don't need to look at the particulars. All you need to do is look at this and it's kind of vacuous and full at the same time simultaneously. And again, that idea of silence that in a way, the silence of the Zapruder film invites some kind of 
fulfillment in some way, or perhaps just sitting back and being silent and not having an answer. And so I think that's really beautiful the way that you dealt with it. When the group of us got together and, and started talking about this last week, it was only a few minutes before we began reminiscing about our memories of these other collective moments of tragedy, uh, these cultural touchstones like Challenger, Oklahoma City, 9-11. You can't think about one really without thinking about the other. And we all have these moments that are ours. Uh, Challenger is my Kennedy assassination. Uh, you, several of you have written on other moments of tragedy and drama. Royce, uh, you collaborated on a, on a piece about Challenger, and you got yeah, to- Yeah, it, it was more of a piece that celebrated America's uh, history of exploration. So it was in three acts, and the second act really dealt with the Challenger um, tragedy. Um, and it was amazing. We got to uh, work with NASA. NASA, what am I talking about? NASA, mm -hmm. and- um, and uh, we, uh, we got to talk to four astronauts and uh, they all happened to be women. And it was unbelievable to hear them talk about their experience up in space. Uh, and it really guided that project along as well. We, we went in thinking that we wanted to memorialize the tragedy and it became very, um, very clear early on that, um, that the astronauts sort of implored us to consider a, a piece of art that, uh, that wasn't a, a memorialization that was more of a uh, of our own uh, experiences or our own ideas or a, a celebration of exploration and what it means to, to be American. And so I, we found a leak in, um, but it was it was very harrowing to talk to those those astronauts who had all lost friends in in that in that moment and, and to hear them talk about uh, the time that has passed and how they are, are sort of forced to, to relive that constantly was, was very heartbreaking and, and a challenge for us to, to figure out what we were going to do, what we were going to contribute as a work of art that, that was meaningful and thoughtful. I'm curious, Royce, have you watched any of the Netflix series that just came out about the Challenger and I all have the no. that led up? It's, uh, you know, prepare yourself. It's not a difficult, what uh, it's a difficult watch it's not an easy watch um but there are so many factors that play into the it's kind of not unlike the way that you two dealt with the lead up to the event it's mostly kind of pre-math you know um uh pre-story but it's it's you know the details are super crucial and, and it just reminded me that my approach to my piece was not only the loss of this dream this beautiful exciting you know, I wanted to be an astronaut kind of feeling, but also this kind of sense that, you know, something had gone terribly wrong and something had not been dealt with as it should have been. And as I, as I look back on it now as an adult, I think about all these assumptions that I had about institutions and, and their infallibility. And I think that's another kind of tr trauma that gets accrued perhaps um, along with the initial impact and, and just the terror of watching it happen. So. I do recommend it, but it's just, and it has the same luminosity, all the televised awesome. footage of that is just, you know, you see it and I've seen it so many times, but seeing it again in this light is just very intense. Steve, I think it was in 2013 with Yellow Barn, you did a young artist program and did, did some work with 9-11. And am I correct that you got to work with some teenagers and young adults who were the children of 9-11 who lost loved ones in the World Trade Center, is that right? Yeah, yeah, they were um, musicians at Yellow Barn. I, you know, I have no, I have no training uh, in, you know, in, um, you know, in trauma. Uh, so we just focused on, 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 on music and this idea that I mentioned before of, of, of um, since music is my mother tongue of, of musicalizing things and um, uh, musicalizing those energies. And it's, and to try to, you know, at the risk of sounding cliche to try to make something positive, you know, and, and it's one of the, the, the great privileges and great fortunate uh, things we have as, uh, as artists, as composers is to, you know, take this thing that's inside that's bubbling, that's, um, uh, you know, that, that causes pain and at least distraction and, and put it out there. And like some, some author uh, once said, you know, I don't write to tell people what I think. I write to find out what I think. And that's what my, my theme at the, this um, Yellow Barn workshop was, is, you know, you, 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 you know don't try to, 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 to worry about telling people what you think. Just find out what you think, you know, just pull that stuff off, be honest, be true to yourself, and, and let's, 
and let's find out what you, what you think about it. We're here in 2020, which is almost a, a, a slow moving 9-11 that we're living through right now. I mean, it feels, this moment in time feels very reminiscent of the late 60s. I think that 2020 will become shorthand the way 1968 is a shorthand for a dark moment in, a, in American history. We, there's divisiveness, skepticism, social injustice. How is music going to help us process what we're living through right now? And maybe some of you know of works that are already out there that sort of uh, analyze and maybe challenge our interpretations of what we're currently living through. That's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't offer that to anyone in particular. Yeah. 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 Well, I, 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 will, I will take a, a long a pass basically but but to say that it's going to take me a while to 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 digest again you know um i don't i right now i'm in survival mode you know i'm trying to make this i have two uh, relatively young children nine and eleven and and um and they don't have friends and they don't you know they're they're doing school online and um and i am uh you know uh, uh totally engaged in 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 um in what, what would the word in denial <laughs> that that's what i'm that's where my i'm at and i know that won't last forever i was i was there i've been there before i've been you know um i'm good at denial and uh, i've always cast myself in the role in various stages of my life as you know maybe it's you know it has to do with family upbringing i'm the one that kind of holds it together um, for the people around me, um, uh, I was the baby of the family, always the, the peacemaker, um, and um, and that's the role I'm playing now. And then when uh, hopefully when things get back to normal, then I will explore uh, my feelings about this. Is is there a general time frame? Like what, uh, Jenny? I guess I'll pose this to you. Is there an appropriate amount of time to wait before you start to uh, interpret a moment in time musically? Oh, I have this argument with my father all the time. He's a historian and he, he's always saying you can't historicize the present. You can't even historicize the recent past. But I actually, I, I firmly disagree. I think we have to. And I think our historicizing will become the stuff of historiography later. And that'll be all the more interesting and helpful to those who succeed us. But I don't think it's ever too late. I do, however, celebrate distraction right now and celebrate procrastination and celebrate consumption of things that spark joy. Uh, you know, TV shows that I love from childhood. I find that I'm very hungry for music right now, actually, and many people around me are, and we're making things, but they're not necessarily anything that's referencing 2020 in an explicit sense. However, I, I will argue that perhaps one day this will become an aesthetic that's, that's connected to 2020, is that we had to distract and look away. Uh, I had a friend last night saying, self-care is not watching the debate. You know, I think there's a, a way in which the turn away from the trauma can itself be a negotiation of it. So... Yeah, it's right. I mean, Royce and I have a project right now in uh, the Houston Grand Opera, which is a comedy that we wrote a decade ago. So mm -hmm. it's not a new work, but I keep thinking about how it's, it's in production. It's going to be a film uh, to debut on the internet. And I feel really grateful that we can offer this comedy to people now. It has nothing to do with the moment, right? right. And with anything that's going on in the moment. Uh, although the characters are actually dealing with isolation, so there are some connections, but you know, in the broader sense, it's not about the moment, but just that there is something that can be 40 minutes of pleasure and escape exactly. uh, for people. And in terms of addressing the moment, I mean, I, I just think, you know, I have a piece that I wrote in 2002 that was my 9-11 piece. No one would necessarily know that. And I think going back to what Steve said about, you know, you write to discover what you think. That was what that process was for me. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how things work their, how they kind of work themselves out in the work in the next two to five to 10 years, I think, for, for people who are, are, are creating art. Yeah, it had to go off of that, I don't think it has been so much that we've been really excited or really hungry to understand this moment and to respond artistically. It's more about the methods with which we are offering our work and trying to get the internet and Zoom and uh, these filmed 
musical projects to a level of sophistication that are that is beyond where we are right now. I think that it's just for, sort of put a fire under us to get to get find new ways of dissemination and because the performing arts are not going to come back anytime soon they're probably going to be the last things to come back we um we are we have these beautiful amazing artists who communicate through sound and through projection to the back of a four thousand seat house um and i'm in a workshop uh, right now in chicago where um they have to be like 15 feet apart or something like that if they have directional singing going on to each so it just mm -hmm. it seems like we are uh that film and media is so important and going to become more integral to our art forms um particularly classical music um and really investing in in ways that that can advance quickly i think is the the name of the game right now and not so much writing a covid cantata yeah, I think that's interesting that you say that. And, uh, you know, since last week, I was thinking about conversation we had and just thinking about us as composers and musicians, thinking about the collaborative effort that we have. I mean, uh, you know, Royce and, and David and then uh, Steve, you had that with Brentano and even with your Challenger piece, Jenny or, or Royce, um, you know, when I did my version of a 9-11 piece, I, I was intent on bringing in a, a children's choir. You know, I went out and asked and, and begged and thought about bringing a younger generation. Um, when we did the three hours in Dallas film, I, you know, uh, Nicola and I had talked about getting high school student musicians to come and perform this. And it's really interesting getting to bring in younger generations to, to perform you know, maybe something that they don't understand. And I think one of the biggest selling points I had with a with concert was, you know, this was, you know, going back to the JFK, um, this was 56 years in the making, right? Some of these kids weren't even, this is for the 56th anniversary. And this was for the 56 years in the making from the assassination to the other composers that we commissioned to perform in that concert to our students being born after 2005, I think and then now performing at the museum in 2019 or, you know, and things like that. I, I think it's the collaborative effort that really helps propel music even stronger. And right now it's, it's difficult to write a piece about COVID. It's difficult to write about the, the social injustices that's going on. Um, but I think the younger generations are going to help us, um, you know, with their ideas and, I'm not saying that we're old or anything. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the younger generations are going to have those ideas and they're going to want to, to have that collaborative effort with their, with younger, even younger or older generations to be able to create what they experience. Because as a secondary teacher, I can tell you, it's, it's just like what Steve was saying. I have, I have, I had three high school kids in my class today, you know? So it's one of those things where, you know, they're being profoundly impacted by, by this situation. And, um, you know, I work at a title one school where, you know, technology may not be readily available, um, things like that. And, and we're doing our best to, to have every student have that, but, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what our, what our younger generation thinks of when they think of 2020. And really, I, to me, I, I would rather leave that in their hands for them to interpret as, as we're trying to, process what's going on in the world. It's interesting to hear each of you say my 9-11 piece, my it, it's almost like a rite of passage. Anyone who lived through that moment in time has to respond to it in some way, uh, whether it's uh, through painting or, or music or sculpture or writing. Um, all of you, of course, lived through 9-11. That's a collective experience that all of us shared writing these pieces, was it personally cathartic? Did you heal through through your music? I will say for me, it was like um, a, a matter of either write this piece or, or give up writing. And at first I thought I was gonna be giving up writing. Um, uh, I, I had a, a commission from the Holland Festival and to write, um, and, they, and their, their charge was to write a piece for orchestra and um, a section of electric guitars. In other words, nothing to do with 9-11, to be pre premiered in 2003. And also coming from Holland, they didn't, you know, they, they didn't have that relationship. Um, and, but I just could not get myself to, to, to work on it, partly due to 9-11, partly due to the invasion of Iraq and the 
people, you know, weapons of mass destruction is like, you know, there's a lot like, a lot like I feel now, a lot like I felt about um, uh, trying to do, you know, after the Zabruder film that, you know, some things, you know, maybe music can't just, can't do it justice. And um, so for me, it was a matter of, um, you know, not, again, not expressing my feelings to the world, just, just finding a way to get whatever this was out into something that I could sculpt um, and then move on. And if I, it was like, if I'd never gotten that out, I probably wouldn't have ever gotten anything else out. Yeah. It's interesting, Steve, because that piece is, I think of that piece as a very joyous piece. Yes. I mean, yeah. it's got other stuff going on in it, certainly, but it's... Yeah, it's, it's, but there's, there's irony, there's joy, but there's kind yeah, of an yeah. irony, particularly at the end, the joy builds until it crumbles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's one of my favorite pieces of all time, by the way. I love that piece. <laughs> do, you, do you guys uh, remember Leonard Slatkin um, conducting the Adagio for Strings spread right after the 9-11? The I think that's one of the oh, right. musical moments that was just you know I was 12 when this happened and just thinking about 9-11 and thinking about that performance I mean I still follow back up to it and that again that was one of the pieces at JFK's funeral right so uh, and I know there's a, a whole big conversation on Dodger for Strings and things but uh, that was like the concert that I always go back and think about whenever I think about 9-11 and I, I I just listened to it a couple months ago when, when all of this happened to be honest with you so um I don't know. It's just interesting to to see those connections even after so many years. So, um, I will say that going back to the catharsis um, question, um, I think that every piece that I've written has resulted in a degree of catharsis. Uh, certainly, when you get to dig into characters that are are real, I've, I've been very lucky. Uh, to have been able to really dig deep into the psyche of JFK, as we've mentioned, and Gertrude Stein, and uh, and the the Columbia, uh, Oh Columbia for Houston Grand Opera, getting to live with Walter Raleigh and with the with the astronauts um, that were fictional in that case, but um, uh, but were based on on these interviews. They felt like a composite of these of these voices that we got to collaborate with. Um, and even in things that are, are completely fictional, like my opera, The House of the Christmas Tree, uh, for, uh, for Houston as well, um, I got to really deal with my, my dad's death. It, it dealt with a, a young girl who was, um, who was dealing with the loss of her mother. Uh, but I got to dig into that in a, in, and deal with my own feelings of grief uh, in the same way that JFK really allowed us to Im imbue those characters with our own uh, with with our own fears and anxieties and all those things, and so I think that uh, when you put the the finishing note or the finishing period in your in my libretto or in a score, I think you you really do feel like you've, you've gone through something. And I'm sure that there are pieces that are going to uh, be be much more monumental in your heart than others. But I, I really do feel that um, that you work through something to create art. Um, and and mine is generally character based, so I get to the. I get to sort of imagine and be and, and to sort of cultivate empathy every day for for different ideas and perspectives and and uh, and it's been a very fascinating decade <laughs> of writing the Bretty. So yeah, well, and I think you have to do that, Royce. I mean, if you don't go to the emotional place where these characters are living, then they won't read as honest, you know. And so you really have to try to understand, you know, what was Jackie feeling. Um, in these moments, what, what would it be to know what was that, you know, that your Absolutely. death was approaching and all these sort of pretty gigantic questions that we had to sort of live with for three years, four years, <laughs> however long it took to yeah. write it. And I'm right in the middle of this crazy workshop in, in Chicago where I'm, I, I've written a piece that is my sort of exploring the, um, the puppy episode of, of Ellen DeGeneres' eponymous uh, sitcom. And for me, as a young gay boy, who I think I was 13 or 14 at the time, really um, seeing this woman be so brave and then to have her whole career pulled from her was similarly tragic. Uh, and also Princess Diana is somebody else that, that, that the moment of her death, I, I, I remember where I was. Um, that was my, my sort of surrogate for uh, living through the JFK assassination. Um, and I just, I think that it's, it's so... Um, 
it's so meaningful. I'm so glad that I get to explore and try to understand the world through imagining the perspective of others. I think it's, it's a really, really remarkable way to spend one's life. As, uh, as someone who lives and breathes the assassination of President Kennedy, and I, I feel like I live more in 1963 than I do in 2020, which is sometimes preferable. <laughs> I am incredibly grateful to all of you because, uh, you know, it's very easy to become jaded and cynical looking at the same films and photographs over and over, recognizing the sad inevitability of what awaits in Dealey Plaza. You have each, through your works, provided me a, a prism through which to do this in a unique and profound way. And uh, Royce and David, I can't think about Fort Worth. I can't see pictures from that breakfast without imagining uh, the opera. Uh, and, and Steve, I can't see the, the black and white photographs of the limousine there at Parkland Hospital without thinking about One Red Rose. And, and Jesus, I, I just simply can't look at motorcade home movie footage without hearing um, uh, three hours in Dallas. It's just such an extraordinary thing. So I'm grateful to you. And I know I'm not the only one who have gained an appreciation for this uh, historic moment through uh, through your music. So thank you very much for that. We're, we're really at the end of our hour here. I feel like we could probably go a lot longer, but I've been asked to keep it to an hour. I do want to leave it open. Uh, if any of you have any final thoughts uh, about the assassination, about your work, about trauma or tragedy in general, uh, I want to leave it open to uh, each of you to say a few words if you'd like. Jenny, I guess we can start with you. Well, I've been thinking as you're all speaking about these words, catharsis, which to me connect to ideas of apotheosis and redemption. And, and the word that I, I sort of leave myself with when I'm writing about trauma, either in music or in prose, is, is endurance. Uh, you know, this will not go away. It's something that's part of us. It's part of the world. Um, there are so many traumas we live amongst that, we, that I think we're all collectively now trying to acknowledge, certainly with systemic racism and, and realizing the land that we're on and the people who came before us and what that all means. And so I think the word endure is, is kind of where I would leave my sentence open with an ellipsis uh, for this wonderful conversation because I, we have to endure these things and we have, to, we have to allow them to maintain real and present even if we want to cathartically close the door on them and, and walk away. Um, I think it's a matter of learning how to live with what's happened um, and, and to endure and to help future generations learn to endure as well. Jesus? I'm just uh, really grateful that I was part of this panel, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, it's just great to put, uh, be able to talk to David and Royce, Jenny and, and Steve, you, you know, you two composers I've, I've, watch and I've studied your music a lot so um it's really it's really humbling to be here and I, I really appreciate that we have this very wonderful connection with the museum and JFK to be able to to talk about our experiences no matter the age gap or anything else or experiences and uh, uh you know all I have to say uh, on anything else is that I you know I I'm also extremely grateful as well to my students who were able to to make my music realization and, and really just bringing them into the scope. Now that's a, a lifetime memory that they're going to have for the rest of their lives and something that, that they still talk about and won't quit bugging me about. So it's also just uh, really, uh, I'm very thankful to be here. So thank you. <laughs> Royce and David. You go first, David. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I just, I think I, I get a lot, asked a lot from young composers about in, or even just talking with colleagues about what is the artist's responsibility in, in times, in difficult times. Is it the artist's responsibility to respond or to, to, you know, to help illuminate? And, and I look at it in a, in a slightly different way. And, and this question uh, or the, the term endurance, I think also maybe pertains, which is that, you know, especially in the work that Royce and I do where there are years uh, long processes they're emotionally quite difficult to sort of work through, you know, because you are having to live in these emotional spaces that are not your own, right? You have to really understand grief or fear uh, or in the case of dog days, you know, what would the psychology of starvation be? I mean, really like not very pleasant sort of things. And I think the question of responsibility comes, for me, it comes down to like, if you 
can do that work, if you can live in those emotional states and still function in your own life, then I think that's sort of where the responsibility comes in that you, you should, because maybe not everybody can and that's okay. You know, but if you can, I think you should, because we do need to document these moments, these tragedies, also moments of joy. Um, so yeah, I just think that, that, that kind of thinking has become a big part of my work in the last 10 years. Um, and, and especially I think th through the process of writing JFK. Yeah. Um, and I will just go, uh, go off that uh, empathy. It's uh, I will bring back that, that, that beautiful word that we need more of in this world. And I think that if we can explore collective experiences, whether they be um, full of grief or, or full of joy, um, I think that's the, the direction we need to go. And we need to suggest that the world is full of people who are, are very different, um, but we are all with that amazing um, quote. It was at Maya Angelou who said, we're all more alike than we are unalike. I think that that's something that's a, uh, that sentiment is, is really, really important these days. Steve, we'll come full circle with you. Yeah, well, listening to, to um, my colleagues speak, um, you know, I, I'm thinking that, you know, they're saying all politics are local, um, all trauma is personal, all this is personal. And that's why I think my first reaction to, to all these things is, I can't write music about that, but, but, but I, I must. And, you know, what Jenny said about endure and what, um, what Royce and David uh, both said about kind of, you know, empathy and living in those places and what um, uh, Jesus said about, um, about uh, being, being humbled and honored. And um, it, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm choked up listening to you all. And it makes me feel, um, for lack of a better word, it makes me feel relevant and important, not, not as an individual, it's like, it's okay uh, yeah, okay. I, I, I'm a composer in many ways. I, I often feel like as a composer, I'm, it's sort of a selfish thing. Um, but David makes me feel better about it. Yeah, I'm inhabiting. It's, it's not easy. Um, in fact, I can't do it in any other mode than music. And in music, I can empathize better than I can in everything else. I'm an idiot savant in, in some ways. But in listening to you all talk and sort of um, uh, and, and hearing that, you know, like hear you, you say things that, yeah, I feel that, I feel that it, uh, you know, at the risk of, of uh, 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 sounding like an old chestnut, it makes me feel not alone. And, and I find that very, very touching. And I'm grateful for that. Wow. This has been a wonderful, incredibly moving conversation. And I am very grateful to all of you for being part of it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. And thank you for joining us tonight. Art Reframes History will be on display at the Sixth Floor Museum until spring 2021. And you're welcome to go to our YouTube channel where you can watch a series of gallery talks called Interrogating Art, where we speak to artists and scholars about the works in our exhibition. Thank you very much for joining us tonight.